Please join us as we sing together, we bow down. Amen. Let me say good morning, everyone. Are you happy to be here? If you're happy and know it, let me hear you say amen. amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is, good. God is good. God is good. Just want to welcome each and every one to church today. And I pray as we worship together that the blessing of the Lord will come and fill our hearts. And when you receive this blessing, do not keep it to yourself. But make sure you pass it on. Share it with someone out there who needs to be blessed. I'm so excited to have our guest speaker with us. I know this man, as I told him in the vestry. I know him just for a couple minutes. But his name is Pastor Gilmore, and I know he's charged with the word of God on his heart, and he's here to deliver. So I will ask you today, while he speaks, Put your phone on silent. Let everything that would distract you from this message be absent from us today because he is here to deliver. So I just want to encourage you, please do not leave the church after the service is finished because there is a potluck and we want a fellowship together. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I want to let you know there will be a special day called Work B. That is tomorrow. So everyone, I'm asking you to come with your strength as we work together and we will do um, any, everything we can do tomorrow, whether it's going to be clean up, painting, anything you can do tomorrow to make it be a success. I pray that you will come and help us as we work together. Also, I just want to tell you that um, there will be a special moment next week, Sabbath afternoon. Where do we go on second Sabbath? Let me see if you all remember what we do on second Sabbath. Not assisted living. I'm inviting everyone to be there because these people, what I love about these people, you know, I'm going to teach you something. The moment you try to give, you know that you get back more? Yes. Yes. So these people, they're always happy to see us. But when I, when I, when I go there, I receive even greater blessing than these people. So I'm asking you to join us and let's have a great time. Also, there will be a blood drive coming up this month. If you're not registered as yet, I pray that I ask you to see Sister Judy. And many of you don't know her, so I'm going to ask her to stand. I'm putting her on the spot right now. Please stand, Sister Judy. No, wave your hand, stand. Thank you, that's a command. <laughs> okay, so please see her and sign up so we can have a big blood drive. For, for this one coming up. 
Okay, and also we will have baking, um, baking bread, right? And this would be a special class um, coming up on June 23rd. So if you can't bake bread and you want to stop by bread, you need to be at this class. Okay, so make it a date and don't be late. And we will have a wonderful time. Also, I just want to share with you quickly that um, the spaghetti dinner for the part final has been postponed, not canceled, postponed. So we will bring it another time forward. And as we dig and seek to find, I don't know if it's going to be gold or what, but we need to dig. And this is going to be for our VBS. So I'm actually never want to support the VBS, the children, and let's have a wonderful time. This would be in uh, July 22nd through to July 26th. So whether you're a visitor, bring your children, and let's come and have a cat of one pot's time. You all know that word? It means a happy time, okay? Let's have a happy time. So thank you very much. At this time, I ask everyone to stand as we do affirmation of faith. And our affirmation faith come to us from the book of Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. And the Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that is them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and honored it. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Let us worship you in the beauty of holiness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Keep standing as praise team take you in music. Shepherd, we love much. We need that tender skin in that blessed pastures. We love for all is the fields prepared. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast taught us that we are. Blessed Jesus. May be seated. We're going to continue our song service as we sing Shout to the Lord.
This is the time where we all will reach out to the Lord, whether for a friend or personal life. Just tell him what's on your heart. Because what? He promised that he will give us our heart's desire. So put him to the test. Reach out to him because he's always there to answer. We will sing this song, Hear Our Prayer, O Lord. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sin and griefs to bear. What a great privilege to carry everything to King Jesus in prayer. Lord, you know the hearts of your people. I pray that you will read it right now. And I pray that you will grant the desire of our hearts. Lord, many are broken. Many are struggling. Whatever way it is, I don't know. But you know us. You are the one that made us. You are the one that breathed into our life, into our soul, the bread of life. And dear God, as we come before you, kneeling before you today, we are praying that you will answer our prayers. So Lord, as we let go of everything, I pray that you would take full control. I pray that you would bless today proceeding. Let everything go according to your will. I pray you will 
put a special touch on our speaker today that he will deliver a message that comes directly from your throne. And I pray that someone will be blessed from this message. Dear Lord, I pray you will continue to be with the Roanoke Seventh-day Adventist Church and all the members and visitors who are here today, Lord. I pray that you will put a special touch on our lives. Lord, we are nothing without you. So we are asking you please to take possess of our lives so we will be ambassador for you. So Lord, as we worship you today, let us worship you in the beauty of holiness. Let all distraction be absent from among us. So Lord, for those who are sick, I pray that you will heal their bodies at this moment. And those who are heartbroken, I pray that you will comfort them. Those who are struggling in whatever way, Lord, I pray that you will show up in their life and that you will minister right now. Lord, we need to hear a word from you. In time like these, we need a savior. In time like these, we need an anchor. And dear Lord, please help us to make our anchor grip on you, which is the solid rock, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So Lord, I pray that you will empty us of self and that we will allow you to fill us with your love and your grace. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing for us. We thank you for what you are about to get done through us. And also what you have done for us. And we just want to give you all the praise and the glory. And let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, and by the end, I hope we've learned something, okay? So there's a, a verse of scripture that tells parents that they should teach their children all the time when they're walking, when they're at home. Basically, every opportunity that they have, they should use it to teach their children. And I had an uncle when I was a kid who took that very seriously, okay? So one day, I was visiting my uncle and we were cleaning out my grandmother's room. And my uncle calls me over um, to help him with something. So I'm gonna call somebody over. Who am I gonna call? Uh, Emma, maybe? Emma, will you help me? Will you be me in this story? Come on. So he calls me over and he says, I need you to hold something for me. So he starts giving me things. He's like, can you just hold that? 
And a few minutes later, he says, and Robin, can you hold this for me too? So he passes me things, and I'm still helping clean, right? But he wants me to hold on to this. I can't put anything down. And it's just random things from my grandmother's dresser, right? So he's just passing me all this stuff, maybe a spray bottle. This is some hand sanitizer, okay? And before I know it, oh, a hymnal too, my grandmother's hymnal. My hands are overflowing with things, right? And so then he passes me one final object, we'll say another book, and now I have absolutely no space to grab anything else, right? Well, for those of you who don't know, my favorite animal is a dolphin. I love dolphins, okay? So now my uncle has something that I really want, and he goes to give it to me, but I can't grab it because I don't have any room in my hands. So he says, what are you going to do? So I start trying to juggle things. Maybe if I hold this under my arm, I can make space to get the dolphin. And he says, no, 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 that's not the point at all. The point is, sometimes we have so many blessings, right? And then God wants to bless us a little bit more, but we don't have room for it. And so the answer, shh. The answer is not to try and make more space for us to have everything. The answer is to give to the people around us so that we can make space to receive the new blessings God has for us, okay? Now you can set all that stuff down. Thank you so much, Emma. I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you my dolphin. I love you, though. Okay, so there's a story in the Bible um, where Jesus taught his disciples and some other people this same lesson. Does anybody know this story? Have you heard this story before? So it, basically, Jesus tells a parable about a man who was blessed in his fields and his crops yielded so much fruit that his barns couldn't hold all of it. And so do you know what this man decided to do? He said, I'll tear down all of my old barns and I'll build newer, bigger, better barns that will hold all of my fruit. And do you know what the Lord said to him? He said, you fool. This very night your soul will be required of you. And Christ said in that parable, such it is with those of us who are not rich toward God but hold on to the things of this world, okay? So the key is to live life with an open hand, to give freely, because if our blessings come from God, then what does that mean? That means that there's always more where that came from, okay? All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your generosity toward us, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we can trust you to take care of us. We pray, Lord, that you will um, draw us closer to you and that you will help us to recognize opportunities to give to others. Bless these children, and I pray, Lord, that you will bless the offering that they're going to take up this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. So you guys can go ahead and collect the offering for today.
Well, as you can see that the kids were very good. Um, I want to put the adults to the test at this time. Let's see if the elders, um, the deacons can be as good as these little children. But as we look at the stewardship, when we think of stewardship, what the first thing comes to your mind? Just be honest. The first thing comes to mind. I'm not hearing. Somebody say giving? Giving. giving. Okay. Anybody else? Money. Okay. Okay. Money. Yes. A lot of people think if we should put a, a seminar for stewardship, all we would talk about is money. But I'm letting you know today, stewardship is not just money. Stewardship is about a thing called time, which I think if we get 36 hours would be better than 24. Right, Ella John? <laughs> because no matter what I had to do for that day, 24 hours seem like it's just not enough for me. But God made it right, so it is good. Also, when we think of stewardship, we're, we're, we're thinking about our body. We got to make sure whatsoever we put in the system, we are, living, we are doing it according to God's will. So stewardship is also about the body. What, what, what are the next thing we could look at stewardship? Stewardship is about talent. A lot of people think they cannot do anything for God. But God has given us all talents. Your talent could be prayer. Your talent could be singing. It could be reaching someone. It could be teaching. Whatever you do, you can do it to the glory of God. And to top off stewardship this morning, stewardship is about everyday living. So it's not about when we come to church, we're going to say, praise the Lord. But we need to praise God in the street as well, wherever we go. I remember, um, I share a quick story, and then I call the deacons. It's like when we have this thing called um, crusade. We always go out and we give tracts to the community. But when it comes to crusade time, we will flood the community. And some of these same people who you will pass through the week without saying good morning, you want to reach a tract to them. It should not be that way. Our life should be constant Christ living, right? So wherever we go, people should know us as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians. Without we have to open, oh, I'm a Christian. Nobody needs to sing that. Just live the life that counts, and that will say it all. I ask the deacons to come forward as we collect today's tithes and offering. The offering will go straight to our local budget. And as they say, give it with love and give it. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for today. As we give today and return also our tithes, I pray that you will use it for your glory. Please forgive us where we have sinned, Lord, and help us to continue to be faithful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, 
love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren, only what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That was absolutely beautiful. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. The words are so great to that song. I hope you all were going through it in your head as he was playing. Um, I consider it a privilege to be up here because I um, get to introduce our pastor, uh, our speaker for today. Uh, he has led a very full life in God's work and we are privileged to have him here. Jay Gallimore is a retired minister but uh, he, he ministered for 18 years. He taught, he, he did many things because after that he wasn't done. 
He, uh, he taught some seminary, st uh, seminary students. Did I say that right? Seminary? So, that's not sounding right. Seminary students. Anyways, uh, he was a ministerial director and executive secretary. And then he was conference president uh, for Michigan Conference for 27 years. 27 years? Yeah. 27 years after, after the 18 he already had completed. So he's really given his life to the Lord and we're really honored to have him here with us. We really appreciate it. He, did, uh, he has written articles and he has some workbooks on Romans and on Galatians. He studied at Southern Adventist University, which is where our kids went. Um, only he went on to, to do theology at Andrews. Um, he has his, uh, he and his late wife, Linda, have two grown children. And he has a one grandchild, 17, 18 months old, somewhere in there. So he's starting to enjoy the grandparent life. Who what a great life. So um, we wish him well on that. But uh, it's my privilege to invite him to come up to the pulpit and, and, uh, and let the Holy Spirit lead. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, for the introduction, and Elder, for a wonderful warm welcome, and to see you. I don't think I've ever been here before. Um, seems like that Roanoke was always off my beaten path, places that I went. But you live in a very beautiful place. Of course, you know that. Um, I enjoy the children's story this morning, and I think you have about 25 plus or minus kids. There's not a lot of churches that can say that. And uh, it was wonderful just watching them. Some of them were wondering if they were going to make it all the way to the front. And of course, others were very happy to get to the front. And uh, I think uh, taking up the Lamb's offering is, is one of the great events of the worship service. So it's just a, a great thing. Um, first of all, I want to say that Jesus went to Calvary's cross for our happiness. He's invested in our happiness. I, I said something to somebody about that this week, and they weren't sure about it. But I'm going to talk to you this day about a very sobering subject. Um... This morning, I'm going to talk about the case for getting ready. I want to say something our evangelical friends, many of them, will tell you that they're going to be sinning right on up till the day Jesus shows up. Don't worry, nothing to worry about. Uh, you're saved, and that's good. You're good to go. I appreciate the Sabbath school teacher this morning. He said something that I've not heard other people say as well. And that is that we are saved by the grace of God plus nothing else. And he's right. So I don't want you to lose that. But this morning I want to talk about the case for getting ready. We'll get into that in a moment. And after fellowship lunch, if we can keep you awake. I want to talk about the gospel and the close of human probation. And then our third part, I'm going to have a question and answer period at some point because sometimes you can do more in a question and answer period than you can actually in the actual sharing, but I, I am planning to do that. But the third, third part, what is the difference between dying in Christ and being alive when probation closes? Those are crucial questions. And I want to tell you this. I pointed out in Sabbath school again this morning. It was good. 
we're not only we're not all there is of God's people as Seventh day Adventists. We know that. But like ancient Israel, we have been raised up in the last days and we have a dispository of truth that must be given to the entire world before Jesus comes. We exist for that reason. So I want to get into this, um, this bit about the case for getting ready for Jesus to come because there are many people today that don't think there is really a need to worry about it. Why, why be concerned about it? Do we really have to get ready? And then, then what does it mean to get ready for Jesus to come? Doesn't that sound like legalism somehow to you? Why this preoccupation? But Adventists are not the only people that say that because every once in a while I see signs along the road that say, prepare to meet your God. What do you mean when you say prepare to meet your God? So I want to talk about the case for getting ready for Jesus to come. And I say that against the background. Dr. McLennan called me to ask me to come and we conclude that conversation. I never had the least idea that I would be standing here today without him present. And I, I raise that not to bring painful memories to wonderful family that he has. But to use it as the backdrop to help us understand that life is uncertain. You don't, nor do I. You don't have tomorrow. You have today. You don't have tomorrow. I'm going to use probably more notes than I usually use because it's a sensitive subject and I want to make sure that I'm not necessarily misunderstood. And I hope this thing will lock. Jesus promised both his disciples and his enemies that he was coming back. And he's coming back not as a suffering servant, but as King of kings and Lord of lords. He comes not with meekness, but with judicial anger. I know you don't like that. But when I look at the oppression in the world, I just reviewed this week the Nuremberg trials. And when you look at the pictures and you hear the testimony, if there is not justice, then God has abandoned His throne. There is justice coming but not before God can gather every one of us who are willing under the shelter of His wings. He comes, this time, not with patient endurance, but with a passion to rescue His church from the jaws of the beast. Urgently, Jesus warned His followers to watch and pray and be ready for his return. He urged his followers to get ready. And he used illustration after illustration. He used words like, but as it was in the days of Noah. Do you think Noah had to get ready for the flood? And I'm just for sake of time going down here. And then he used the illustration that there will be two women or two men in the field. One will be taken and the other. One gets saved and the other gets. And then he would say, watch. 
Therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And then he uses the, uh, the picture, the parable of the thief. He says, if the homeowner had been aware or been prepared, he wouldn't have gotten taken by surprise. And he warns us, you can find all that in Matthew 24. He warns us to be ready because if we are not ready and taken by surprise, there are going to be bad consequences for his followers. This is directed at his followers, not at those that are not his followers. Although we would like for them to be their, his followers. And that's why we invite them to become his followers. Even more sobering, he tells a parable about two servant leaders in charge of his house. He said, who is in that faithful and wise servant who is master made ruler over his household? And it's an it's a explicit warning. One was faithful leader, the other was an unfaithful leader, and the consequences were not good for the unfaithful one. For the faithful leader, the consequences were wonderful. Above all, they should be watching and feeding the members of the church, so the church will be ready. You've got a new pastor coming, and when I heard his name last night, I said, you're blessed. You can tell him I said that, too. And then you can add to those sobering parables, the parable of the ten virgins. All were members of God's church. But five were ready, and five were not. And I want to ask you what made the difference. You know the parable as well as I do, and I don't have time to get into all of this this morning, so I want to cut to the chase. What made the difference? It was the extra container of oil. Now, you may be visiting this church today, and I hope you are. And I can't answer every question that I want to bring up in the next second or two, but there are good elders here that will be happy to help you. But you need to ask yourself, what's that extra container? We know what the oil is. It's the Holy Spirit. So what's the extra container? It's not the lamp. The lamp has got oil in it, and it's burning the lamp is God's word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not. Well, what's the extra container? Why would you need that? A few weeks ago, somebody had heard me say, and I, I like the GPS. We've all gotten dependent on them nowadays. But somebody heard me say that I st still wish I had a map because I like to see the context of where I'm at. <laughs> and they very kindly went and got me a map, and it's in my car. And I almost pulled it out yesterday. And I will pull it out again before I go home because I want to pull it out and I want to see the big picture. And the big picture is great. But when you get down to trying to find Patty McLennan's house, you need a detailed map. God promised his church. He says, here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. In chapter 12 of Revelation, he says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And Revelation chapter 19 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And I believe this church has that gift within it. It is not to take the place of the lamp, but it is to help provide oil for the lamp in the end of time. Now let me ask you the question, who was greater, Jesus 
or John the Baptist? You don't even have to. We all know what the answer is. But John the Baptist was a lesser light to do what? To point to where the greater light was. And the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, is given to point us to Scripture. I've, I'm reading right now Acts of the Apostles, and I never am ceased to be amazed at the insights that support Scripture in that wonderful gift. And if we're going to be ready for Jesus to come, you must have two things. You have to have faith in the gift, and you've got to use the gift. And it will help give you that oil that you need in that extra container because we're going to need all the oil we can get. I don't think we have any idea what's about to come down on our heads. I'll leave that alone. So there are ten virgins, five were ready and five were not. Finally, Jesus tells the story of the three men that he gave talent to, to invest for the master. Two of them invested in order for the master's return and they were highly rewarded. How do you invest for the master's kingdom? How do you buy, as Isaiah says, without money? Well, I'll tell you how you do it. You buy with time. Everybody has time. I, I have a friend of mine. I'm not going to get this done by 12 o'clock. Are you okay? We have fellowship lunch today. If I take a few more minutes, Brother Elder. Okay. I had, I had somebody tell me, he, says, he said, friend of mine, wonderful pastor, he said, uh, he said, for some of you folk, he said, church is an appointment. For a lot of the rest of us, it's an event. <laughs> it's going to be more of an event today because we've got fellowship lunch coming. And we're going to get into this this afternoon uh, a lot more. So he tells these, these three guys, they were, given, they were given talent, and they were supposed to exchange that talent. Two of them did well, and the other one did nothing. All of this is about getting ready for Jesus to come. And then Jesus quoted, look, this is one of the most sobering texts, and this is from the mouth of Jesus himself. If you want to look it up, it's Luke 21, 34 to 36. And he quotes, say, Luke quotes Jesus, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. The carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come on you unexpectedly and that's the great theme through uh, through Matthew 24 and 25 is that Jesus coming is going to surprise the world and he's saying to his own people I don't want you to be taken by surprise Watch therefore, he said, uh, let me finish this, and the day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come on all of those who dwell on the face of the earth. It's going to be a worldwide surprise. Technology and all of these things are reaching the place where people are going to say, we've got it made. We've got it figured out. There's no disease that we can't counter. There's no difficulty that we can't fix. We've got the technology to do everything. But none of it is going to work in the end. Watch therefore and pray always. How much? that you may be accounted worthy, whoa, accounted worthy to escape 
How many of you want to escape the things that are coming on the earth? I do. To escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Have you ever thought about what that would be like? To be alive, to see the greatest sight that the human race has ever seen. Jesus coming in all of his glory with all the holy angels, no veil between, and to see him and be able to stand and not die. As one Old Testament character said, when they had seen the angel of the Lord, they said, I think it was Manoah and his wife, said, we're going to die. We've seen the Lord. She says, no, he, we're not going to die because he wouldn't have shown himself to you if you were going to die, my words. They had an appreciation of what it meant. And they would just saw the form of the angel. But what's it going to mean to see Jesus in all of his glory? Read Revelation chapter 1. His face shines like the sun. How long can you look into the face of the sun? And those eyes will read our souls. They'll know every, there's not going to be one bit of secret left. Nothing. Every secret thing will be exposed. These three things that Jesus mentioned should uh, be of special importance. One is carousing. Our world today, which... Our world today wants a constant party. Everybody wants a party. The second one um, is drunkenness. In the state of Michigan, Michigan, they've legalized marijuana. And by the way, this, this marijuana nowadays is not your grandfather's marijuana. It's many times more potent because they spent the time enhancing the plants. And guess what's happening in the state of Michigan? Automobile accidents are going way up. And the worst thing is psychosis or mental illness is going off the charts. The third warning is the cares of this life. And everybody can ad identify with that. People tell me all the time, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. And in my head the response is, busy doing what? Busy doing what? There's something to do in the preparation for the coming of Jesus. Otherwise, Jesus would not have urged us to get ready. To meet Jesus alive in our fallen condition takes preparation. But what kind of preparation? Jesus has not left us ignorant about this. In Revelation chapter 6, the sky recedes as a scroll when it's rolled up. And what do the kings of the earth and the rich men and the mighty men, what do they say? And I want to tell you, at this point in human history, the world is very religious. It's very Christian. Babylon is not an atheistic organization. The last movements are religious. These are people that said to themselves, we are going to be ready, uh, we, we're, we're saved, Jesus is with us, we're going to evangelize the world, 
Everything is going to be great. We're getting people back in church. We've got a Christian nation now. We've got a Christian world. We're going to really be ready here for every, The world's going to be good. And when Jesus comes with an unexpected surprise, and the reason He comes unexpected is because they think that the impersonation of Jesus by, the, by Satan himself, they think that was the real Jesus. And when Jesus actually comes... They're shocked. And here's the reaction. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We like to read the first part, but not the second part. For the great day of his wrath has come And who shall be able to stand? That's that's their question. Who can stand? It's like them saying, Lord, you you weren't fair. Saved by faith. We thought we were saved by grace. But we can't stand before you and we're running for the mountains. You've been unfair. Who can stand? God, you didn't keep your promise. But I'm telling you that chapter 7 is the answer that God will have a people who will be able to stand. And chapter 7 has four mighty angels giving the answer to that. And those angels are holding back the winds of strife. They're doing that this very second. This very second. Until the people of God are sealed. I didn't write that. So if you're going to be able to stand, we must be sealed. And that's what I'm going to get into this afternoon. What does it mean to be sealed? Because whatever it means means to be ready for Jesus to come. Whatever it means, it means that you'll be able to stand. And my plea to me and to you and to all of us, Jesus was not playing games when he said, watch, watch. Watch. We're going to close our uh, worship service with uh, singing, Come the Fount of Every Blessing. It'll be on the screen. Ask everyone to please stand and let us sing this song. Hallelujah. Songs of loudest praise. 
commitment to him and get have the pastor baptize you maybe you know that maybe you've just been playing around the edges i want to plead with you time is running out don't play around the edges make a commitment to the lord jesus christ give him your life be part of god's church god's church is going to go through i gonna say that again god's church will go through it's God, God is not in the business of failure. And by the way, he's a very good finisher. And there may be some of us here today who were part of God's church. But we've been retreating back toward the edges. We've not been making progress. And I want to plead with you today to make a new determination. You'll take Jesus serious. You'll watch and pray. Father in heaven, you've heard the appeal today, and only the Holy Spirit can take someone by the hand and lead them. But I pray that you'll draw all of us to yourself today. Before this Sabbath day is ended, I pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll not only have a clear picture but that we will have the faith to trust you with our lives, to trust you with all of our life, to trust you with our happiness, to trust you with the direction of our life, to be so surrendered to you that we're unafraid. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. to just stay back, have fellowship lunch with us. And you, you saw what happened a while ago. That was just a tip of the iceberg. So please stay back and let's have a wonderful afternoon. Okay? With Pastor Jay Gillimore. Thank you. Whatever you want to do, I'll do whatever you tell me. I'm your guest.